the stuff that sort of makes the Internet of Things and the Internet of Everything boot up in the morning, um, the software and the services and the systems that, li that live behind that. Uh, he's had a fascinating background working on all kinds of technologies, imaging and software and so on at GE, uh, IBM and the MITRE Corporation. And uh, currently he is the VP and uh, Global Technology Director at General Electric. Bill. Thanks, Alistair. It's good to be here. So, um, you know, transformational is a word that often gets overused, but I really want to, and I think it's appropriate to talk about what GE's doing. Uh, several years ago, two years ago, in fact, I was brought in to help GE transform and deal with what we saw as a transformational change. And in that transformation, we're really talking about foundationally changing our products and services and how we deliver them. And it's very simple as to what's happening in the industries we serve. So GE builds locomotives for rail. If it takes a picture of the human body, we sell it into healthcare. Uh, our gas turbines, wind turbines, et cetera, generate 25% of the world's electricity. Uh, we have jet aircraft engines uh, out there. And when you begin to look at all of these big in heavy industries, we see a transformational change occurring. And I want to talk about that. I want to talk about why the cloud is enabling that, but what it means for the cloud. And simply put, the change we see is a f movement from an analog business to a digital business. And so I wonder if we want to talk about that first, and then I'll talk about how we see an architectural shift in how these products and services are built and the underpinnings of that. So we talk about this shift and we think about the next decade as the decade of the industrial internet. And when we think about that, we look at the last decade and we see what the internet has done to consumer businesses, right? How it's transformed retail and payment systems and music and everything else. But quite honestly, it's done very little to transform industrial businesses. But now that we start to look and see, the technology is starting to come along that's actually allowing the internet to transform these industrial businesses. And what's, what's at the heart of this is the idea that machines become intelligent and get connected, and that software is used to analyze the information coming off those machines, and we're not talking about business intelligence. We're talking about deep analytics, deep statistics, machine learning, modeling, things that foundationally not just anybody can do, is really deeply understanding what's happening, looking for signatures in that information. And that's going to require a real foundational shift in how we build our systems to be able to take advantage of that. Because today, most of the machines aren't intelligent. Today, well over 95% of the information in the industrial world is dark or not even stored. And so this is the foundational change that's going to happen. And as we look at it, you know, we've done a lot of research into how this is going to play out. And it's really kind of interesting. First, uh, when we look at the industries, it's not like one is going to lead. In fact, a lot of the industrial world, in their ability to absorb this technology, often can be a laggard. But what we're finding is that for these kinds of systems, that almost all these industries are actually moving a lot quicker. And it's uh, aviation. And it's how aviation can be more productive in the use of resources, in the use of fuel. It's how locomotives can be smarter about use of fuel and speed to delivery, and so on. So we see all the industries out there playing. In fact, we've looked at this, and there's a paper somewhere on the GE website that was done by a number of economists that said, if you look at the gains in how assets are utilized in these industries, how resources are used like fuel, how operations and maintenance is done, within the industries we serve, there's about a trillion dollars of opportunity today that we see. 
trillion dollars a year. Um, but what uh, requires, of course, is a lot of what you heard from the prior set of speakers. Is it really requires a world that is not used to the kind of digital technologies coming into play and being used to build out their systems and their operations. So underpinning this is there's no way to unlock that value without foundationally changing how products are built, how you build a gas turbine, how you do machine to machine communication, how you collect that data. And when we talk about data, it really is phenomenally big data. When we think about our gas turbines and we look at what it, what it takes to uh, collect all the data, if we collected everything across our entire turbine fleet every day, which we can't today, we're talking about petabytes of information at that scale to be able to collect, store, manage, and manipulate. But in order to unlock the value, we're going to have to figure that out. So it's really a requirement of rethinking how these systems are built. And it's not going to be driven out of the IT shops. It's got to be driven by the operational people who are running the systems, who are running the power plants, and them being able to consume that technology easily and effectively. And today, there is a real divide between these two, but we see that divide beginning to close pretty quickly. In the end, what, what's interesting to us, last year we launched nine new products in this area. And it's some of the fastest uptake in these products that GE's ever seen. And the reason why is in closing that gap, we found that you can't sell the technology. You can't sell cloud as cloud. You can't sell virtualization. IT directors under that data center people, that's how they'll buy. But in this case, there has to be a direct correlation of productivity in order to see the acceptance of the technology. With that, interestingly enough, there's a complete belief system in the technology. There's often the operational people don't even look at the technology. So you can begin to see that when we start to look at this, there's a lot of barriers to entry, but the opportunity here is high. And I'll just give you one, is we know that uh, the airline industry spends $200, million, $200 billion a year on fuel. The ability to put a new aircraft engine out takes years. But the ability to tune the engine, the ability to give a pilot insight on how to operate the engine, a 1% change is $2 billion a year. And if you look at an industry that's always on the verge of profitability, $2 billion a year makes, it, makes an industry profitable. 5% a year in efficiency gains can really foundationally change an industry. And within every industry, what we see in these big industries, there's five, five, anywhere from 5 to 20 key levers, like fuel efficiency, that if you give a 1% to 5% change, you're talking about tens of billions of dollars to the industry as a whole. So that's really what this is about, is how can these technologies enable these kind of productivity gains? And that's what the world is looking for. And there's no other way to do this. And what we see is that the way these systems are going to be built and the challenges we face are first, the machines have to become more intelligent. Now, GE, uh, almost every big machine we make has more sensors now than ever before. And sensor technology is one of the cornerstones that we are putting a lot of our investment into. Just having the information is hard. I, I'll mention this later, but one, one sensor on a, on a gas turbine that generates electricity generates 500 uh, gigabytes per day. We have 12,000 of them globally. So how do you collect all that and manage it? There are 20 sensors on a gas turbine. So this is going to become a foundationally big, big data problem. The second thing is you got to figure out how to store all that data and manage it. And I'll also say this, real time takes on a whole new uh, meaning here because the ability to decide that you're reaching a critical event where a blade's going to break and shutting that down, knowing it 10 minutes afterwards is interesting but not useful. So how do I see these kinds of things in a time frame that allows me to predict, prevent, and act upon that. The analytics part of this goes way beyond the, need, the capabilities of many organizations. The analytics 
have to be done by this emerging world of data scientists, and it's really hard to find people like that. The, the other part of this is not about getting rid of people. The fact is, how do I give people access to the insight? The pilot's still going to determine how to fly the plane, but how do I give the pilot information about how do I get there on time versus how do I save fuel costs? And how do I put information in their hands to allow them to make better decisions? And all of that is completely distributed. So when you look at this, the cloud is going to be the underpinning, is one key underpinning. Big data environments are a second underpinning. And the third underpinning is really incredibly insightful analytics. Those three things, people who get those three things right, are going to have a great opportunity to sell these kinds of technologies. When we look at cloud as it exists today, you know, a lot of the technology is useful, but the reality is it has to be applied in a verticalized fashion. And this has always been a very difficult thing for technology vendors to do. But we see that this is going to have to happen because when we begin to think about the cloud needs in healthcare versus aviation, they're very different. And the cloud will have to extend, for example, out into the aircraft. How you do that, how you have machine-to-machine -machine communication and you in, in, embrace that as part of a broader cloud architecture becomes something that has to be dealt with. So we see there's going to be a continued evolution. We're looking to the cloud community to bring us technology. We're partnering today very strategically and we'll make some announcements uh, in the near future about this. But the fact is we're partnering with a lot of vendors to try to figure out how to take generic horizontal technology and apply it in these environments. And it's not trivial. So we look at this idea of the industrial cloud as having to appear, and our customers want to embrace it. Now this I could spend a lot of time on, but uh, I don't have that time. But if you just think about security is going to be different in a utility world than a rail world. It doesn't mean it's less important. It means the idea of assets being fixed versus mobile changes how you think about security. The kinds of people, open and closed architectures in terms of how they're connected to the outside world. The use of public cloud, private cloud, all of these things will have to be, be worked through and we're seeing these every day. But what we see is a couple of key things at the, in the architecture. At the bottom is how do you connect these machines, and it's going to start with large-scale machines, because those are the ones that have the greatest productivity impact. Now, we see that as the OEM of these machines as a key part of our responsibility. But the question is, where's the technology? What standards? Machine-to-machine -machine communication. A good example of this is in the wind world. When we sell wind turbines, and we, we are the leader in selling wind turbines, we have technology now in the wind turbine, a fully running data center, one might think of it, that does analytics and on the performance of that wind turbine. And the wind turbine that is performing the best tells all their friends in a wind farm now what it's doing different than them that's allowing it to see one, two, three, five percent greater productivity. So the ability for performance when you have a number of machines communicating and interacting and by the way, one, two, three, four percent, that's all bottom line power generation, free money for that utility. So the ability to put a lot of processing local, but yet have that data come back in the cloud so you can crunch through that information and load other kinds of insights into the wind turbine is becoming the architecture we're already building today. So how do you connect it? How do you do machine-to-machine -machine communications? How do you make it real time? How do you automate a field force so that they don't have to climb up the wind turbine to look at it? How do I manage what we already are managing as petabytes moving quickly to exabytes? And we certainly see in the near future, in the next five years, that any industry will be managing about a yottabyte of data in their entire farm. So when we look at this, this is going to become where we start to think about how to build these systems. So what's going to drive that productivity and what do customers want? What they really want is applications that do zero unscheduled downtime, preventive maintenance, processing efficiency, 
and real-time optimization of systems. This is going to be driven by very large data sets, but it's all going to be about capital asset productivity. That's what they're looking for, get more out of my assets that I have. And most of this has nothing to do with people because the efficiency is actually the operations that you're already doing. Meaning that you're not getting rid of people, you're giving people insight to do their jobs. So we see this idea of industrial clouds as becoming inevitable. We see we're a long way from getting to where we need to be. But today, we're already launching these clouds in the industries we're serving. We're already starting to absorb and the technologies. There's still a lot of gaps. But when you just look at what the possibilities are, they're huge. And I think at the cornerstone of this is going to be how you take big assets like a power plant and make them more efficient. Not how you take 50 billion little things and make them more efficient. It's going to start with the big things first. It's going to start with how we make refineries more safe, how we make them more productive. It's going to start with how do we make trains go faster and use less fuel. Those are the things we see. Those are the applications. So when I think about the future, and the way I think about it is without the cloud, without big data, and without machine-to-machine -machine, uh, communications, this can't happen. And those three trends are the enabler that's allowing the industrial world to get there. We certainly are trying to lead the way, but uh, we'll look forward to working with many of you in the future on this. So thank you very much for your time and attention, and hopefully you see the transformation coming. Thank you, Steve.